Um, it's a little bit of story. Uh, even I, I can, I can, I can show. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's start with. Uh, let's start easy, and let's start with a, a little bit of of story. I don't know if it's here. No, it's. I thought it was here. Wait a second. Yeah, yeah. Everything okay? <laughs> Thank you. So let's well let, let's review a little bit what uh, we discussed yesterday for single particle systems that Barbara discussed and Martin discussed. But again, just to 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 remember, everything starts with the with the Feynman propagator, and the idea that uh, so Feynman. Put his pro his uh, path integral. Now I don't I don't remember dates, uh, but I guess this was I don't know uh, 39. I don't oh no no oh no it was in the 60s. I don't remember. In any way, in any case, way before uh, Feynman, uh, this guy who is actually a Nobel Prize uh, winner not for semi classics but for the magnetism and stuff, but he already had the, the intuition that um, quantum mechanical amplitudes are kind of related with uh, classical actions. He had, uh, this you can see, for example, in solvable examples, in, in uh, the free particle. The propagator of the free particle has the classical action in the exponent. The propagator of the harmonic oscillator has the classical action in the exponent. So there was already the, 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 the intuition about that, but nobody knew how to go beyond linear systems or, and uh, harmonic systems. And he proposed a form of the semi-classical propagator, but without the sum. You remember, you have a sum over classical solutions. He didn't have the sum. So this kind of accounted for the shortest classical solution. And we didn't know how to go beyond that. And it took precisely um, a participant. Okay, um, Gus Biller was the one that decided to rethink about this, and already in the in the 60s, Van Bleek, I think, is 30s or 40s, um, and uh, Gus Biller decided to rethink about that problem, but from a different point of view. Because, I mean, Van Bleek didn't have didn't have any trace formula or or, or anything. Is this supposed to be there, Barbara? I can. Uh, a second. Okay. Mm. Then Gutzbiller had the Feynman formulation, and he approached the problem as we explained, Martin explained, thinking about I will do an stationary phase analysis of the of the Feynman path integral, and then he derived the, the propagator in the form that we we know uh, 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 today. And um, so that's why this object, if, uh, if this is about terminology, you can call it the semi-classical propagator. But for example, in my lectures, in many books, um, uh, you can call it the Van Bleck Gutzfiller propagator. This is, hmm? and, uh, please, Martin has an important comment for sure. Yeah, meaning the, the the next the next path, right? Yeah, I mean, but but Van Bleek doesn't have a sum. Yeah, this this uh, this I'm pretty sure that Van Bleek does. So what what uh, Martin mentions that of course is relevant is that um, mm, the Let's say, remember that the propagator is written as sum over classical trajectories. And then, well, you start with the shortest. Hmm? You don't start with the longest, you start with the shortest. And then what changes between the shortest and the next contribution is that the usually the shortest path has the shortest, the, the action is a minima. But for the next path, the action is not a minima anymore, but a maxima. Remember that. 
This is not about minimal action. It's about a critical action, extreme action. And there is a topological object that tells you uh, when you go from local minima to local maxima, which is uh, called a Maslow index, which is some extra phase you have in here. And, uh, and this is what, uh, what Martin mentioned. And to account correctly for this effect of going from minima to maxima is super complicated. You need really, really good uh, mathematics for that, as Martin explained. And, uh, and yeah, and, and Gus Wider got that right. So, I mean, amazing. Okay, and uh, yeah, so far for terminology. Okay. The This happened to Horacio yesterday also, that this stopped working. I don't care, but... Yeah, but I... I, I Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will go into all this uh, uh, later. Let's, let's come back to our problem. So, brief reminder from yesterday. Uh, bosonic many body quantum systems live in a space called the Fokker space, uh, w which account for the bosonic nature, indistinguishability, and bosonic symmetry. Uh, natural bases there are occupations. The Hamiltonian has two pieces, uh, one body terms and two body terms. One body terms are bilinear in creation and annihilation operators. Two body terms are uh, fourth order in creation and annihilation operators. Um, we were able to, to find an expression for the propagator between the physical focus states by going through a propagator in the space of quadratures, these Q guys, which are not physical. So this propagator there, this guy, doesn't admit a physical interpretation because the Q states are not physical states. What admits an interpretation is this. But this is a trick I'm using to be able to write a path integral. Of course, this expression is mathematically exact. And these overlaps are related with Hermit polynomials. You have a bunch of these overlaps here, a bunch of these overlaps there. Eventually, we have to do this integral. And the good thing is that for this object, eventually, I can do um, I can attempt a semi-classical approximation because I know a path integral, because it looks exactly as the path integral in, uh, uh, for single particle systems, just that the Hamiltonian is a little bit funny. The Hamiltonian contains Q squares, P squared, Q to the 4, P to the 4, but we found uh, already a way to deal with that. So I can write a path integral for this object. And from now on, I will kind of specify the systems we are dealing with. This object is called the bose howard hamiltonian It describes cold atoms in optical lattice. And it's kind of the, the most standard bosonic Hamiltonian you will see around. Remember, one body terms, quadratic in the creation and initial operators, and two body terms, meaning, remember, this n operator is something like b dagger b. So this object is fourth order. This thing, I hope you recognize what this. Do you recognize this? Look, I destroy and, uh, a place and move to, I, I destroy at one side and move to the other. And of course, you have to allow the, the opposite process for things to be, to be Hermitian. So, what do you think this thing is doing? So, yeah, who? Yeah, momentum square. It's, uh, that's, that's precisely, you say that, right? That's the kinetic energy. If you remember from your lectures in um, quantum mechanics, when you uh, put the kinetic energy operator in a lattice, well, it's doing exactly this, this kind of jumps. And uh, that's it. So this is a discrete version of the kinetic, uh, ki kinetic energy. And of course, well, it fits with intuition. It's moving things around. And that's, that's perfectly fine. 
And uh, this is the interaction between atoms, which is assumed. Please, please. Yes, yes. That's the hopping term. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I, I didn't use the name hopping because it was then too easy to realize that this is kinetic energy. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we call it hopping not, 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 not only in Bose Howard, also for fermions. And if you are doing condensed matter, you know this is the type binding model for fermions. Uh, this, is, this is what takes care of the spatial dynamics of things. You can put this little guy here are called on-site energies. Well, these are the potentials. If you have a, a potential around, it, um, it is expressed in second quantization as a couple to the number of particles there. So kinetic energy, local potential, time independent. I could do it time independent, but I'm not. And that's the interaction between atoms that is supposed to happen only when the atoms are on the same site. And uh, it's a simplification. You could also put interactions between different sides, this, this works. So this is the, when, when I mention a Hamiltonian from now on, this is what I meant. Hmm? And uh, you see, it's a particular case of the monster I wrote uh, la last time. And so what we know now is that this object admits a path integral representation And now I will write the, the, the whole monster here. We have, remember, a t integral in Hamiltonian form contains a symplectic term. That is always there. And uh, if, you, if you think about where is this thing coming, it comes from the overlap between Q and P. Remember, this is the... P dot Q is the, is the overlap between a P state and a Q state. And why P uh, scalar Q, uh, why, this is what I meant. Well, proportional. So do you remember what, what is this thing reflecting? This thing is reflecting that the Q and P operators have a commutator equal to IH bar. That's, that's so at the end, at the end, the origin of this term here is the fact that P and Q don't commute. Hmm? And that's why in many presentations of path integrals in books, um, they, 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 they interpret physically this as coming from the non-commutativity. Hmm? I, I, that, that's fine for me, but uh, I like to see it as, well, it's, it's part of the action. If I write the action in Hamiltonian form, I get PQ dot minus uh, Hamiltonian. And, but uh, just that you know what is in the books. Now, what comes here is this object that we call the mean field Hamiltonian. Which up to ordering problems, which is a different story, and I won't go into that, but I'm willing to discuss with you if you have questions. This mean field Hamiltonian of Q P is obtained from the from the focus space from the quantum uh, operator by instead of the creation annihilation introducing complex variables that we call psi, and uh, they, are, you, they are complex, so usually you call them the, the fields. And sorry for the notation, I will stick now to this. Instead of alpha, I will use L. And I hope there is a D, no, it's an L, sorry. Let's stick to this, but just to clarify, briefly, yesterday I wrote this like this alpha equals 1 to d. Sorry about that, but I think it's okay. Uh, well, I have here 
the, the hopping um, amplitude. And then you just rewrite things without hats and put psi's. So this is a psi conjugate L, psi L minus 1 plus psi conjugate L minus 1 psi L. Of course, this is real part of psi L time conjugate times psi L minus 1. Uh, on site energy, which becomes in psi L modulus square, and interactions, you let's do this like that psi L square times psi L square minus 1. Um, you shouldn't take this minus one here that literally because it is um, the translation from the from the quantum remember that to go from the quantum to the classical I I introduce a, um, a procedure which requires ordering things in terms of Q and B. There are different ordering prescriptions. I can go into in, into that in detail. But the good news is that uh, for semi classics this thing will be very small compared with this, and then who cares? But if you want to seriously buy the book, uh, write the, uh, the path integral, you need a prescription to define your classical Hamiltonian. And this has to be unambiguous. And there is a lot of work on doing that properly. It's not an easy thing. For example, uh, if you do field theory, you want to remove zero-point fluctuations, zero-point energies. Because if you have infinite number of degrees of freedom and you have uh, zero point fluctuations, then the energy of the system is automatically infinite. So we all are familiar with this. If you have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, well, the energy, the ground state energy is infinite. Hmm? And people in field theory solve these problems using ordering arguments. So for example, they would kill this guy here. Things like that, okay? So, uh, there is, there is an issue with, uh, with how, to, how to define the, the object you put in the, in the path integral properly and in a way that has physical sense. But the main part, hopping on site and something uh, reflecting interactions, is like that. So you don't need to, uh, uh, to worry that much. Okay, that's the main field Hamiltonian, where these fields. Again, by that, and this is how you express then things in terms of uh, um, uh, Qs and Ps at the classical. This is our classical Hamiltonian. Uh, you let me do this. You should have told me, hey, what about your boundary conditions? Q at zero is Q initial. Q at t is Q final, and no boundary conditions on the P uh, paths. Okay, this is where we were uh, uh, yesterday. Um, now, well, this is, uh, this is the path integral. I'm not doing still any semi-classical approximation. The, the, what I want to do in these 20 minutes is to at least give you a hint how we do the semi-classical approximation. How, remember, I need to justify it. Of course, this, this thing has a classical limit. Yeah, sure, I mean, there is it. Q dot, ah, there is an H part somewhere. Hey, you are not paying attention, people. That's very important. H part is not longer the small parameter in this theory. So it's, it plays a different role, it's over there. And these two things together can be, can be um, put together as 
i h bar psi dot is partial of the mean field Hamiltonian, but with respect to psi, hang on. It's doing nice. H bar psi dot is the H mean field, but now you write it in terms of size and size star, which is easy, is this guy. The ugly one is QP. That's the ugly one. The one in size, is super, super compact, super cute. And uh, yeah, that, and uh, we recognize this as a compact way of Hamilton equations for for this problem. And I, I told you that in uh, if I take the continuum limit, this equation becomes the gross Pitaevsky equation, that is the equation of mean field uh, dynamics for bosons. Since we are in a lattice, discrete orbitals then uh, the, this equation for this Hamiltonian is called the discrete gross Pitaevsky equation. And, uh, okay, good. Uh, there is a question here that nobody asked yesterday, and I will put B here. I haven't seen anything about chaos, you see? I started with uh, quantum mechanics, where, strictly speaking, there is no chaos, because quantum mechanics is a linear theory, blah, 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 blah. There is an eternal discussion, but in principle, you cannot define anything chaotic there. Then I constructed the path integral, but it's exact. Then I did the semi-classical approximation, and I never, ever used anything related with the particular properties of the chaotic or not classical mechanics. So, this thing will enter when we apply this formalism uh, in, the, in the second part of the second 45 minutes of today. So, don't worry, this is coming. Okay, now let me, mm, I cannot be as explicit as I would like, but I will show you something cute. So, if I kind of formally consider the limit h bar going to zero here, you see, the action has two pieces, this one and this one. And only the Hamiltonian part is affected by h bar. So if I formally take h bar going to zero, this part of the, of the exponential uh, is a smooth function, doesn't oscillate like, like crazy. The one that oscillates like crazy is this one. So when h bar goes to, to, uh, goes to zero and you want to do a stationary phase, you the equations that you get are the equations without the symplectic term. And these equations simply tell you that you have to be at the minima of the Hamiltonian. That's it. So there are no dynamics. No, nothing happens there. So this is a, a limit that you could consider, but certainly h bar going to zero is not giving us any sensible classical limit here. So, um, or no, the classical limit is there. But the stationary phase approximation based on h bar going to zero uh, doesn't, doesn't tell me much about the quantum mechanical problem. This is what I want to say. But OK, so this is not a, a good option. We, we knew this. To kind of motivate what I'm going to do, I will come back to this and consider. I will consider this. The number of particles is super large. The occupations are super large. Of course, the sum of occupations is the total number of particles, hmm? of course. And uh, so what, what I mean by that is that what I mean is more like the densities which is the occupations divided. So let's do a picture that we remember. The number of particles 
you have a fog state, and this has n1 particles here, n2, etc., n d particles. And I want these local numbers to be, to be large. OK, you can tell me, what do you mean by large? I can answer that. In practice, for us, n equals 2 is already large enough, for example. We suffer a lot with n equals 0, n equals 1. That's bad. But n equals 2 is, for asymptotics, infinity. So, in the, well, I can, this sounds like a joke, but I can, uh, I can, I will show you examples where we, we really push this down. Please. Uh, I, I, I will need you to, to tell me what do you mean by having information. What the, if what you mean is the following statement. Given the classical Hamiltonian, I can construct all quantum mechanical properties. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah. But, uh, but what do you have to do? You have to take your classical Hamiltonian, put it there, and calculate this path integral, which is really difficult. This is a very different statement than the statement that the, and look, the classical Hamiltonian there is this function, but if I plug it here and calculate this monster, I'm not using the classical equations of motion. Now, whether the classical equations of motion tell you anything useful about the quantum problem, that's a different issue completely. But yeah, the statement that given the classical Hamiltonian, I, I have all the quantum mechanics. Yes, uh, that's, that's true. But I'm not using the classical equations of motion at all for that statement. Please. Yes, 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 yes. In that sense. So I'm cheating. Yeah. Uh -huh. And sorry, I, I, this is important here. This is what I mean, sorry. So the only way to have very large occupations and uh, in a very large but finite number of particles is that the densities are, are large. So if you have an infinite number of wells here in a finite number of particles, forget it. You will have many places, many occupations which are zero. No way. So I'm talking about here finite number of uh, wells find a number of particles that is large enough such that the average occupation in each well is large. Now, I can check that eh? because the average occupation in a well is the expectation value of the number operator in that well with respect to the quantum mechanical state. This is something I can go and check. So, okay, I check whether my state is such that or the region of states I'm looking at is such that the mean occupations quantum mechanical mean occupations are, are, are large. And, uh, well, there is a bunch of things there to discuss, but um, imagine for a moment that I'm there. So what happens, I will analyze what happens with this guy and what happens with these guys here. So the following, now I have two, two screens. the following result holds for large n, okay? So I just write it like that. And as I say again, I will write the result for in asymptotically, for asymptotically large n, but this formula works for n equals two already perfectly. So this looks like this. There is some amplitude here kind of complicated function, uh, square roots and stuff of, uh, around, but you have cosine of f of q plus, I think, plus pi, plus pi over 4. And this is a good approximation in the sense that this kind of leading order in, um, in 1 over n. And this function f, sorry, it's a function of q and n, sorry. q n. This function f
is an integral of um, up to Q of, sorry, or we forget it, dQ prime. That's it. Minus, minus, minus. So n is very large. You can forget about this plus 1 if you want. So it's something like uh, square root of 2n minus q squared. I, I cannot go into, please. Um, well, this is, this is defined up to a constant. So you can, this is a function of q, and q is here. The integration variable is q prime, and the lower limit you can put whatever you want. This will just give you an extra constant. Was this your question? Ah, uh, sorry. This is cosine of f of, this thing is a function of qn, which is defined here, plus pi over 4. Sorry about that. My pi is really ugly. I know, I know, I know. Well, I, I can go into details here, and there is, uh, this, there is a lot of inter uh, important physics in this, in this object, but let me tell you just that the, this is a mathematical result. Hmm? If I take their mid polynomials and I consider the asymptotics for large uh, quantum number n, for large n here, this, the index, then this, this, this equation is true. It's a piece of mathematics, but it has very interesting physics I cannot go into now. Okay. So we have this monster integral. Look, everything here, Q initial, Q final, and what is inside here are integrals. So I'm integrating everything, all the Qs, all the Ps, and the, what is left are these overlaps. And so I will do a change of variables here. Now consider the following change of variables. I will call big Q is a square root of n small q. Uh, oh no, it's sorry, the other way around. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Well, I can do that. N n is a is a parameter and fixing my 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 focus space. And well I can go and do this transformation. And what happens here is that you have this uh, square here. Because of this square, you get an n in front. And I can pull out uh, that n with the square root, gives me a square root of n, and I have another one here. So let me write just quick. I will write instead of, instead of a small q, a square root of n big Q. I made this change of variables. This is still depends on small n. And this integral is ah, sorry, uh, the square root of n Q0 and the Q is Extract the square root of square roots of n again. I get one from here when I do the differential, and I get another one from here. So I get an n here in front. And this is the q prime a square root. Little n is large, so I will forget about this one there. And then I will have here. Okay, and what I have, what I achieve here is that under this change of variables, I get this n in front of my, of my f uh, function here. 
in the yeah, that okay. Okay, this sounds very, very stupid, but this tells you and remember that these objects are certain uh, fractions, but um, I'm, I'm considering, uh, or this now, the interpretation of these numbers here are kind of uh, the occupation on the, on the, on the given uh, site divided by the total occupation, there are the little n's are some fractions of the big n. And these appear uh, in this expression. Okay. Now, let's keep this result for a moment. So all these objects get this structure, cosine of big n times some integral. And this transformation I'm doing, I will do on q initial and q final, all of them. And since I do that, I will do it also in Q initial. Q initial and Q final are integration variables. I can do whatever I want with them. I can rescale them. I can do whatever I want. But when I change Q initial and Q final by that, then it's kind of natural to also change the integration variables in the path integral itself. So remember what is the, you know, it's when it gets, please. Uh, I'm doing something stupid. But this is the square root of n here. Okay, so uh, this, I was worried about that. So <laughs> thank you, because I, I needed the capital N to be here and uh, here only in this way. So I'm, I'm happy. That's correct now, Martin? Ah, uh, there is a, sorry, there is a two here. Now you're happy? Yeah, okay. You should pay attention like Martin, you know? Um, okay. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. And um, kind of a spoiler here. What is behind this is something like that. So these things are kind of cool. Q squared and P squared will be comparable to N. That's, that's kind of the, the spirit of this. A small N, the local occupation, not the big one. Yes. And uh, there was something else, sorry? Uh, I didn't do this. Okay, <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> Happy with it. This is what you what you mean, right? Okay. This is not that super super critical, but. Thanks for correcting me. Uh, we have to be careful. Okay. Now to the meat. Um, I will do this change of variables on the uh, on the Q integrations that are explicit here. This Q final appears here. This Q initial appears there. Remember that it's a bunch of integrations over momentum there. I will just do the same rescaling for everything. I will do. Q, all the Qs, Q final and Q initial. I will do exactly the same transformation. And I will do it also for the paths, the integration paths. This I can do, why? Because this are, I'm, I'm doing an integral. I can do a change of variables there. Now that this change of variables makes sense and produce something that is useful, we will see. But this, uh, the time being, is just a change of variables. OK, now let's, let's see what happens with the different terms in the action when I do that change of variables. So remember the action. 
that's the action, okay? So let's start. If I do this change of variables in the Q paths and the P paths, then this gets a square root of n, this gets a square root of n, I get an n in front. This is what I want, so I'm happy so, so far. So I will simply write the action functional that depends on the paths in Q and P. I will write it, sorry. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, I will write it in the new variables. I want to use a new set of paths, which are very simple, just the scaled version or the, of the old ones, the same for P. Ah, dot, this is functional. Okay. Perfect. So what's this? When I just do the substitution, the action I get, for the symplectic term, I get an n times p of s, q dot of s. I get this n in front, makes me happy. Uh, now let's take a, the, a look at the Hamiltonian. What happens with the Hamiltonian when I do that? So the Hamiltonian contains these one-body terms, these ones, which are bilinear. So this is p squared, q squared, pq, doesn't matter. Whatever, well, on, the, on the, that scaling, all this uh, one-body part gets an n in front. Okay, so let's do it gets an n in front, and the, the, the hopping term, let's write it. Uh, why is that? Yes. Uh Um, I like that better, but I, I, I trust William, my beloved student, William, which is very smart. <laughs> and okay. Meaning? And so, so what do I do here? Okay, so like that. <laughs> you guys uh, fix the problem uh, uh, between the two of you. We can make a votation. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> let's do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, William Martin. So William says a square root of n. Who agrees? Wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. Martin. <laughs> uh, self votation is not allowed. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was expecting this comment. <laughs> Ah, sorry, I, I, I promise, <laughs> the way I have it, I have it without the square root, certainly. This is how I have it. And, uh, but okay, this is, can, we can fix this, sorry. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that this n is very large. So you can, you can put it, but the effect will be 1 over n, and eventually 1 over capital N, and these effects are subleading I will consider only uh, leading uh, order terms in that. But uh, you, you can put it. This is already uh, an approximation for large uh, n uh, here. And, uh, and uh, this guy is way larger than that. So that's why kind of I, I neglect this, uh, these things. You could, uh, you could already remove it here, no problem. 
in the, this, this, this works. So this is kind of formal. Sorry, uh, wanted to say something? Is about this? Is about this again? I, I, I prom. No, the square root is gone. We don't want the square root of n. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we are. Uh, <laughs> no, I actually, this is how I have it in my, in my notes. I got confused uh, with myself there, <laughs> but uh, this is how I have it. Okay, let's come back here. So when I do this change, the only thing that happens with the ba one body is that you get the n in front, and things look the same, except that uh, instead of this psi, which is given by that, you get another psi, which is, uh, should be capital, but I'm bad with it, so I will call it um, um, phi, like big phi. Ah, sorry. Minus, this is, okay, yes. And there is a one over h bar here. I need the space. Minus one over h bar sum over L. And now I do, I put the hopping term minus j, but with the big psi conjugate L of S psi L minus one of S. Um, let's do plus, well, you know what it is. Ah, that's one piece of the one body part. The other piece is the one with the on site energies. For these guys, the only thing that happens is that you get an N in front of everything. And I will stop there with this part. But now we have the two-body part of the, these quartic terms. Let me forget about this for a second. It's not so important. Consider the quartic term. So with the quartic term, we have some bad news. Is that, wait a second, this is N. And the interaction term looks like this. Looks like the U, and here you have this capital Psi L of S to the 4, plus this uh, other term that you can put in here, so it's, it's, it's harmless. And if you do the scaling in the interaction part, there is some bad news. You get an N squared there. Well, this is pretty obvious. I mean, you have a system of interacting particles. The, if you just add the energies, each particle contributes with certain energy. The energy is additive in the number of particles. But the interactions, the interaction energy, is all particles against all particles. So it scales quadratically with the number of particles. This has to be like that. And the fact is, if you have a system of particles and you just let it grow to, to infinity, immediately the interaction energy will brutally dominate all physics of, of your problem. So this, is, this n squared is simply reflecting the fact that interactions scale quadratically with the number of particles. Imagine that you have a three-body term, then you have an n cube, and so on. So, and then, ah, sorry, well, I always, here. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Now comes the most important uh, physical consideration of this lecture, which is the following. Let me dream. Let me think, OK, I like this n in front because this n parameter goes in front of the action and allows me to do a stationary phase approximation for large number of particles. This is what we want. And everything works because the then the integrals you have here can be consistently done in stationary phase. Everything works, but I need this n in front. Well, I can put it out. Mm. 
is right there. I can put it out in front of the action. It's right there. But I still have this N here. Now comes the, the, the physical assumption. To treat or the large number of particles is a... Um, um, defines a semi-classical regime in these systems if this quantity is uh, said to be independent on the number of particles. So, this, 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 this has many names. Uh, in uh, high energy um, physics, you call it, uh, I never know, T. Hooft. Hooft, what is the right pronunciation of the, you know, the Nobel Prize, Tuft. Uh, Toft, okay, that's the right problem, okay. I, this is called Toft scaling. This is, you set the number of particles to be very large, and you set the interaction to be uh, small, in a way that the product is, uh, is, uh, remains uh, bounded. There is a question, sorry? GN square? N G square. Okay, but G then is whatever coupling, yeah. Uh -huh. but, but it's linear in N. I, I, I think so too. Yeah. Uh -huh. But thanks. We have an expert there, so it's good to. And what is the right pronunciation? Tuft? Tuft? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we will introduce a kind of renormalized uh, interaction B, which is N times the original interaction, and I will keep V constant or, or, or fixed to some value, while N goes to infinity and U goes to zero. So this is a good theory for weakly interacting bosons. Now, don't get confused. By weakly interacting, I mean here that the coefficient of the interaction term is small. But you see, because of this effect, a weak interaction can produce a large interaction energy. Okay? And then this is what matters uh, uh, here. So this thing is essential to do. Um, in fact, it's essential to trust the mean field equations to say something about the bosonic system. If you don't have this limit, your mean field equations are something else, are describing something else. So we need that. Now, once we do that, then great, I have this nice N in front. The path integral looks like the exponential of a, a function of your variables, functional of your variables, with a large parameter here. Let me put it here for a second. Now my path integral looks like that. And then, when capital N goes to infinity, I'm perfectly allowed to do a stationary phase. And I promise you that semi-classics will give excellent approximations to what happens in reality. Please, please. Again? That's a, I'm very happy that you're posing that question. Um, I will take this V. Now, this V I will is, 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 is fixed. What is important is that V doesn't grow with N. This is what is important. Now, once I do that, I can still compare the size of the kinetic term, the J, with the strength of the potential, which is V, not U. And uh, as a, this is kind of a, a, a rule of thumb. You have to check in a case-by-case -case basis but in these systems, chaos happens where this part is comparable to this part. Therefore, I will, and we have checked this, when J is of the order of N U. And then, okay, well, this you, you can, you can, this is completely realistic, happens uh, uh, a lot. Of course, when, when J is too small or too large, uh, you're going to integrate all limits, as you know. This system is integrable for J infinity and J zero. And, but in the middle, when, the, when this uh, condition holds, uh, you have chaos, and this has been verified numerically. Hmm? But thanks for the question, that's important. 
Okay. Well, I, I, I will go into some details of this uh, in the exercise session with you. We will do it together and understanding how to actually finish the calculation. I'm just saying now, you are allowed to use the semi-classical uh, um, propagator uh, obtained by applying a stationary phase in the large n limit to the path integral. You get the propagator, and then I have to do this. And this is another piece of the story that I have to go and, and, and do. But the final result, which now we come back to this, well, this is, uh, this is the Hamiltonian I was mentioning. Um, that's the final result. Let me. The semi classical propagator now looks, guess what? As a sum over classical solutions. Yeah, sure. Classical solutions of what? Of the um, mean field equations. The classical equations of motion for this mean field Hamiltonian. But look the boundary conditions. Remember the boundary conditions we have here was initial Q, final Q, no condition over momentum. But I'm integrating over Q. Q is gone, so I have Ns. What is the classical interpretation of N? Is the modulus square of your field. So look the problem I have to solve. I have to take my classical equations of motion, and instead of fixing the initial and final Q, I have to fix the initial and final occupations. This makes sense, right? I mean, the, remember, what, what is the occupation? The expectation value of the number operator. What is the number operator? B daggers time, times B. What is the classical limit of that? Psi dagger plus, times Psi, modulus of Psi. So what you are fixing are the absolute values of your initial and final uh, fields. And this is, again, a well-posed classical problem. You go and solve it. Now, I cannot tell you how hard it is to solve this classical problem. It's unthinkably hard uh, thing to, uh, to solve. But it's perfectly well-posed mathematically. Now comes the, the comment of Hilda, very, very, very handy. Because in Regensburg, we don't solve this equation. Solving this equation with that boundary conditions is really, really hard. Okay, so. Um, consider that the problem that the, pro the classical problem you are used to solve in your lectures are initial value. How do you solve it? You put a runge kuta integrator. These are differential equations. You start with the, the initial coordinates, the initial momentum, and then obtain the next coordinate in momentum by integrating log in a little step the equations of motion. We do that all the time. Do you actually know how to solve a problem where I give you initial and final coordinates? It's a completely different story. You have to think uh, differently. But it's mathematically well posed. The solutions exist. Blah, 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 blah. And um, so this is very hard to solve, but we don't solve these problems. What we solve, what we say is that we look for a regime where the system is chaotic, and we use the statistical properties of the solutions to make predictions. And now, finally, we, we come to the point of making predictions. So. As I mentioned, that's the classical equations of motion with these boundary conditions. You have several solutions. Um, is uh, yeah, is here. You can think about what I'm doing here. I will get a little bit technical, but you know what I'm talking about. For a second, look what I'm doing here. I have the propagator in certain representation. The representation is Q and P, and I fix initial and final Q. What I'm doing when I do this is I go to a different representation. What is the meaning of different representations in classical mechanics? Wake up, tell me. How do you change representation in classical mechanics? Again? That's it. So what you are doing here is doing a canonical transformation from QP, which is here, this is Q plus IP, into a new set of coordinates, of phase space coordinates, which are N and theta. This transformation is canonical. So I'm just changing the coordinates in phase space where I represent in my uh, propagator. That's all. And you can show, actually, that this guy here is the generating function of the canonical transformation. 
So everything uh, uh, fits. So now I have a, a classical problem, which is kind of less intuitive as position to position. I go occupation, occupation, but these are phase space coordinates. And then I have, I, I give you the initial occupations. You know this, but you don't know the initial phases that you have to find. Pretty much as if I give you initial and final coordinates, you need to find initial and final momentum. The same thing. Okay, and um, so we took this and started thinking. Um, uh, I, I, I don't have time, sadly, to go into that, but one thing you can do with this machinery is to do what Martin did, to derive the trade formula for density of states. So the Gooseville trade formula for bosonic fields, this has been done. But uh, you can do autox and all that. Let's, let's go for the first application we, we consider about this. Now, um, remember that the modulus square of the propagator in quadratures is not physical. These are not physical states. But the modulus square of the propagator in occupations, well, that's of course physical. I prepare my system with certain occupations. Let it evolve. What is the probability to measure this set of occupations at time t later? The most basic question in quantum mechanics, probability to go from here to there, uh, probability to measure these occupations and then measure these occupations. The postulates of quantum mechanics say that's the modulus square of the propagator. Good. So let's calculate it. I have the semi-classical propagator that expresses the propagator as a sum over solutions of these mean field equations with initial and final occupations. It's a double sum, has some amplitudes and some phases. Now, I will do the most brutal thing you can do with this thing. It's a double sum. I will take the diagonal part, and I will call it the diagonal approximation when the two trajectories I'm using, gamma and gamma prime, the two solutions are the same. So what happens there is that you have total cancellation of these phases, and you have an expression that doesn't have, doesn't have h bar. Look, h bar was here. This is completely, completely gone. And um, in this case, okay, let's don't go into details. But the diagonal approximation, the independent of having or not h bar, the diagonal approximation, what it's doing is that it kills things that oscillate. You see, this is a double sum. If you change initial, n initial or n final, the the occupations, this thing changes, and this changes because this amplitude change and because this action different change. And that's a mess. That's a lot of oscillatory things going on there. When I select the diagonal approximation, I kill everything that is oscillatory. Now, it can be formally shown, and this I will do in the exercises. It's a very nice thing to prove that the diagonal approximation, the diagonal contribution to the probability, uh, probability, to the probability is simply the classical probability. And you will tell me, oh, but wait a second, there is no classical probability, no? Sure, there is. Let's come back to coordinates. I'm posing the following quantum mechanical problem. What is the probability amplitude to go from here to there? Now let me pose the classical problem. What is the probability, classical probability, that I throw particles at this position and I get them there? How do you solve that problem? You take a bunch of particles here with different momentum. Let it evolve in time, and you count how many of those hit this final position. Doesn't matter what is the momentum. It can be formally shown that the diagonal term of the probability is the classical. We will do it um, this afternoon if someone is interested. And uh, well, OK, so this means that quantum mechanics is the rest. Quantum mechanics in the semi-classical approximation is the off-diagonal part. So you have to go and dig in the dirt, because there's a lot of things going on there, to try to find out where there is some systematic things that uh, don't oscillate like crazy or something like that. You have to study the off-diagonal part. What is the first off-diagonal contribution to this double sum? It's what is called, Martin introduced this in the context of periodic orbits or transport, I'm pretty sure. This is called the weak localization correction. This is terminology from condensed matter. Doesn't matter. It's very intuitive. Look at this. Think about configuration space again. That's not the best thing to do always, but let's think about configuration space. I have a position. 
and I'm asking the quantum probability, the, the quantum mechanical probability to go from this position to this position. Then you construct the paths doing that. And, uh, um, and then you have this double sum over path. Now, what happens if the initial and final position are the same? Well, you can do for if the initial and final position are the same and the system has a property called invariance on the time reversal symmetry, which is n has nothing to do with the time machine or anything, okay? It's a mathematical property that tells you that for certain systems, if this guy is a solution of the equations of motion, this is also a solution of the equations of motion. If you have a magnetic field, for example, you, this is not the same as that because the magnetic field twists twist things in different directions. But if you don't have a magnetic field, this trajectory, this trajectory are different, but they have they they cover this exactly the same path in phase space, except that you invert the moment. Now, if the two initial and final positions are different, well, you have this path. The time reverse path is not there. Okay? It, it, it doesn't appear because you're going from here to there. But if you join them, suddenly you have this path and this path. They both contribute. So they are of diagonal contribution. They are different paths, but with the same action. Hmm? Then what happens is that one of these, the diagonal part gives you the classical. Now, if n, the initial and final occupations are the same, if they are the same, you get an extra contribution there that gives you a factor of two. So if I look at the probability to go from certain state to another state, when as a function of the second, the final occupations. When the final occupations are equal to the initial occupations, I will see a coherent enhancement of the probability. It's a quantum mechanical effect. This is no classical. The classical probability is whatever is this thing. This is a quantum coherent effect. This is quantum mechanics, mechanical interference between paths in focus space. It's many body quantum interference. Well, is this true? Let's, okay, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. There is uh, some other things, but let's, let, let's move. Uh, well, we, we, we tried that. So with, uh, with a group of uh, people doing heavy numerics in, um, in Belgium, we said to check whether this is true in the, please, Okay, now, absolutely yes, this will, uh, that's an advanced question. Of course, if I have paths going, ah, sorry, should I do it? Please. Yeah, I was wondering, like, because even if you have different initial and final positions, you can have paths that trace loops in different directions where they are different, but would have the same action if there's time reversal symmetry. Yes. And the, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and this was, uh, did you get to that, Martin? Did you do encounters and, and loops or, or? Okay. So Martin did it for the single particle case. Indeed. If you go from here to there, then you may have things like that. And then one can show that there is, could be another guy. Uh, this cross, how do I paint this? Probably uh, like that. I don't know, like that, Martin? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. That, Mm. Can you draw it? Mm. Again, so I'm going from here to here. Okay, what do I do? I go down from here to the middle and down. <laughs> like this? Almost 
No, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. The answer is yes, and he will give you an example of, of, of that situation. Huh? Thanks, Mark. Okay. Exactly. Okay, they have to be almost parallel. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I sh I should know this way better. Thank you. So this is a, a situation where um uh you have you start getting um contributions from pieces of trajectories that uh move along loops in a different way. And uh, and uh, so you will have more things the, the, the cool thing about this particular contribution is that, you see, it's order one. These things will be order one over n. Hmm? And, and the, they were constructed in the single particle case, were constructed, analyzed, shown to be there by Martin and, 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 and Klaus, 2001. And uh, with this, you can explain the universal uh, RNT fluctuations of uh, conductance and stuff like that. So, uh, yes, they are there. And they feel whether you have time, time reverse asymmetry or not. But this one is huge. It's, it's, a, it's, it's order one. It produces a factor of two in, in Hezbin, and that's why it's important. And just terminology, in the context of, um, of um, optics and also transport, this is also called coherent backscattering. But now, this is coherent backscattering, but in focus space. This is an interacting many-body system. If this is the coherent backscattering of, 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 of transport is that you inject single particles into a medium, and if you look the ones that come back exactly with opposite momentum, you see a quantum enhancement of two. Fine, but this is, in, uh, an, in, this is an interacting many-body bosonic system. It's a, it's, a, it's a different space and everything. But the, the essence of the phenomena is interference between trajectories and their time reverse. So, um, this answer your question? Okay, good. So, we, 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 we went to, to, to check this numerically. This was 10 years ago. So, with the numerics we had at the time. And, okay, I have a single particle. Uh, I, I have a many um, bose hobart system. We put it in a ring, hopping, on-site energy, interactions. Um, you see? Uh, the uh, how was this in this? Um, I need to remember, but we check that we are in the regime where the dynamics is chaotic, and this you 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 can more or less uh, uh, check. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but okay, we just did the quantum mechanics. We solved the Schrodinger equation and calculate the probabilities, and uh, this is what I don't like this picture. I like this picture. So these are the results. This is the time. You see, everything here depends on time. So this is a propagator. The propagator. So I'm asking the, the probability at given time. So here the time is, um, is increasing in certain units. The typical unit you use is inverse hopping. So I'm moving the time in this direction. And uh, I have an initial state, which is exactly this one. This is my initial state. 3, 2, 3, 4, 2. These are the occupations. And the, the points here, the symbol, are the probability to go from this initial state to the corresponding final state at the given time. So, and uh, we are taking the quantum mechanical and averaging because, remember, you have diagonal, coherent by scattering, and the rest, and the rest is an awful mess of oscillatory things. To get rid of that, you do a, a little average. So I did the little average, and this is what you get. So uh, consider the large time limit, which is what is in here. You see, the probability to go from the initial state to any of the final states is more or less the same. It's homogeneous. This reflects the fact that the system is chaotic. In a chaotic system, an initial, is an initial um, um, uh, point in phase space tends to, to explore not all, but almost all the phase space. So eventually, things kind of equilibrate in the classical probability being homogeneous. 
you have the same probability to go from here to there, from here to there, the same. It's an ergodic behavior. But when you want to come back to the initial uh, point, the quantum mechanics is a factor of two larger than the classical. And this is pure quantum mechanical effect. How do we know the, and that you can say, oh, but okay, this, I'm not that convinced. How do we check that these effects are quantum mechanical? We apply a magnetic flux, because a magnetic flux does nothing on the classical mechanics, a line of flux doesn't change the classical mechanics, but the quantum mechanics feels the, 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 the phase, the, the flux. So if you put a flux, uh, where, are, where is it now? Yes. If you put a, um, uh, where was it? Here. Let me put it complete. If I put a, a magnetic flux, kind of magnetic flux, what is the idea of the magnetic flux? That remember that this guy has the same action as this guy. Classical mechanics doesn't care about actions. Quantum mechanics is about actions. But this action is the same as this action. Now, you put a magnetic field, which is very weak. The trajectory is still the same, but the action gets modified because the magnetic flux is different if you do that or if you do that. And if you put that in a chaotic system, you have all these contributions pairing with themselves with a different flux. The flux is random, and then it kills the wind localization. So it's a known effect in quantum transport that if you introduce a magnetic uh, field, a weak magnetic field destroys the weak localization correction. Well, we did it, and we saw that when you increase the magnetic field, you start with zero magnetic field. When you uh, increase it, you destroy the interference effect. So this is really satisfies all the requirements of a, a coherent backscattering or weak localization, but in interacting many body systems. Please. Ah, uh, yeah, you, um, I mean, the no, you, um, on site potential doesn't work. What you do is uh, the hopping uh, has a phase. Ah, okay, okay. So, so then in a way that things accumulate a phase. That's, uh, it's not really a magnetic field. They call that some people call it a gauge field, but it looks like a magnetic field, but, it, but it's not. Okay? It's a synthetic gauge field. Okay, so this worked. So then we got kind of excited. Let's, let's, uh, we started doing hot talks and uh, everything that we could hand, put our hands on. But in particular, uh, we decided to check how well the propagator propagates. I mean, I want to propagate stuff. Let's do. Let's do now, let's calculate trajectories. I mean, in the, in the case before, I didn't calculate any trajectory. I found this effect, and I, I used that the trajectories are chaotic, treat everything ergodically and average. But we can also do the heavy homework, not we, Steve Tonsovic, which is a kind of famous guy in, in our field uh, in Washington State uh, University. He went and calculated the, the, the whole homework. I'm showing you here what is called the, um, the return probability, meaning you start with a state, put it evolved, and come back to the same. Mm? And uh, now the, I'm not averaging anything. Mm? This is really, let's calculate all solutions of the mean field equations with the boundary conditions, plug, calculate the actions, Maslow indexes, and Steve has Maslow indexes, of 300 something is unthinkable and really, really heavy. But okay, that's it. I can compare quantum blue with uh, semi classics uh, red. And you see all the, all the quantum effects, all the wiggles around, all this uh, thing on top of the classical result, which is the, the dash line here. This is what is called the truncated Wigner approximation. It's, the cl it's a classical way to propagate uh, um, many variosonic states. I won't go into that. You see, as expected, the classical goes through the quantum, but the quantum has all these fluctuations, all this information there. And uh, the, uh, sorry, this was semi-classics. The quantum is here. And the semi-classics captures everything. So adding solutions, and this is the semi-classical approximation, eventually goes bad hmm, for very long times, but you see it's vastly superior to the truncated Wigner, which is the most popular method to propagate bosonic states 
uh, um, uh, quasi-classically, is vastly superior. Now, you can, of course, ask, uh, how, why do I care about the, 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 the classical goals right through in all these uh, wiggles? Well, the wiggles are the quantum mechanics. We want to do quantum mechanics, please. Oh, that's a um, thermodynamic limit, define it. Constant density, sending um, number of sites to infinity and number of particles to infinity. If the density is large, I'm pretty sure it does. That I can show it, no. And here comes the problem. If uh, there are, we can do kind of um, this uh, cheaty uh, uh, thermodynamic limit, which is, fix, which is infinite density. So find a number of sites, number of particles to infinity, density is go large. I can show you, I can actually prove that this thing gets better and better because it's a one over n uh, uh, theory. Now, if the density is large, but the number of sites grows also, then um, I, can, I can justify mathematically that it works. Uh, but I cannot, sh I cannot show it numerically because, well, the number of, we, we have done something great here, which is we went from the original number of degrees of freedom, capital N, now the number of degrees of freedom is the number of sites. So that's good news, right? But if you, still the number of sites is the number of degrees of freedom. If I increase it too much, my phase space is like this, and I cannot do semi-classic there. Mainly the problem is that we, the, 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 the community doing, classical mechanics and uh, kind of chaos, dynamical systems, we have very limited tools to deal with high dimensional phase space. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's bad. I mean, if, if, you, if you talk, uh, if you show me some, uh, my, my first picture of things is, uh, to, is four dimensional phase space, two dimensional point carry surface of section. And here we are, we, people are interested, the, the, the experiments I didn't show. Uh, these kind of things, well, they have 100 sites. Imagine doing classical mechanics in a phase space of dimension 200. I, I simply cannot do that. So there is a natural limitation for these methods uh, there. And uh, open question, anyone that is interested is super welcome to throw ideas because we are kind of, kind of stuck in there. Now, the definition of chaos doesn't care. Chaos is a chaos in integrability for large, but finite number of degrees of freedom is perfectly Hamiltonian case and integrated, perfectly well defined. If the system, if the number of degrees of freedom is large, perfectly well defined, completely useless definition. We need to rethink all that, and we we, we don't know at the moment. It's a huge, uh, probably well, the most important question in many body physics at the moment. I would say is to try to understand that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. It's important. Okay, well, I hope that uh, this, this, um, this uh, nice picture convinces you that semi-classical propagators give correct quantum mechanical results in the right limit, and that together with chaos, you can use them to predict things that you actually can check numerically and, and observe. And, um, and with this, uh, the last thing we did was controlling quantum chaos. Uh, this is another application of this machinery, but actually, I don't, we don't need to go into that uh, now. So there is a, no, there is, let me finish then with this picture that I really like. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. It has been a pleasure. I hope you, you enjoy. And uh, well, if anyone is interested in some of the mathematical details or calculations that I left aside during these uh, two days, I will, I will be there today repeating uh, some of them. And uh, I will be here the whole week. Any comment, question is uh, super welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> what time is it? I would like to know if after you 
did the semi-classical approximation. Are you only interested in describing this subspace of the Hamiltonian that you mentioned yesterday? Are you are we only are you only interested in describing that little part of the all what I think is all, the all complex of quantum mechanics? Are we only dealing with this part? What 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 what, you, you what can we say about the whole? Uh, you mean uh, in terms of the Hamiltonian? If I'm uh, interested only on this type of Hamiltonians, no, or in this region of uh, on the semi-classical yes, region, yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, semi-classical techniques are only justified in the piece of Hilbert space that admits semi-classical states. Okay. This is the direction of your question. Yes, yes. I mean, if you, in full honesty, on being completely clean, that's where we 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 have to work to justify what we do. Now, of course. We are physicists, we, we, we like to push things. And I didn't, I thought I have the slides here, but I didn't. We did this thing with a Bose Howard system of, um, I think, how was it? Seven sites, seven sites and eight particles. So obviously, this is not a semi classical state. Occupation one, uh, occupation smaller than one. Okay. We did all this and we got it right again. So you hit, uh, you have the enhancement and uh, hits the right uh, point, everything. And uh, so this means that, as happens in many situations, you can push this thing to, to, to what we call the Dilwit limit of low densities. But the thing is that, okay, it worked when we did it for certain particular problem. If you come to me with a problem in, the limit, in another piece of Hilbert space where the densities are low, uh, I can tell you, I can try, but I, don't, I cannot justify whether it will work or not, which happens all the time with asymptotic methods. And uh, so to be completely honest, uh, well, no, I prefer to say there are things that are beyond reach with these formalities. For example, fermions. Fermions cannot have large densities in this sense because you have one or zero. Yeah. And, uh, but we did kind of semi-classical monster theory for fermionic fields. We put it in the computer, we made some predictions, and it worked again. But then um, the people from many body localization came and said, okay, let's, let, let's do this stuff with many body localization. This we cannot do, for example, and I still cannot do. And uh, so I, I feel more comfortable working in, in uh, can be sometimes a little bit boring. The most interesting physics is not in the space of uh, the chunk of Hilbert space that is semi-classical. But uh, this is where these methods are guaranteed to work. Okay. You are free to try in any other region and let me know. And the other question is, uh, when you say that your system is was a chaotic one, uh, did you, how did you confirm that it is chaotic? I mean, the Great question. spectra was uh, Rigner Dyson or something like that? You do. You do spectral statistics and then invoke Bohiga's conjecture to say that the classical limit is chaotic. Or you do classical mechanics. And of course, the high dimensionality kills you, but um, a colleague of Martin in Bristol uh, was one of the first ones with a postdoc, um, Remy Dubertrin, Sebastian Muran, de, de Remy Dubertrin, in this. Um, let me go quick because this reference probably you may like. Here, this reference. They actually went to the big pain of taking the mean field equations in, a, I don't know, they did, I, I don't remember, probably five, six dimensional phase space, throw trajectories, divide the phase space in pieces, and count how many times the trajectory visits those, those, those pieces of phase space, meaning they check something like ergodicity. I, I, I have an expert on dynamical systems here, so the ergodicity has to be used with care. But this, this idea that if the system is chaotic, then a trajectory explores more or less in an homogeneous way all regions in phase space. It's kind of ergodic behavior. Then you can check numerically. But it's very hard because it's a seven-dimensional phase space. They did it, and they showed that there is a regime where um, ergodicity holds. And in this, in this uh, regime of parameters, you have Bigner Dyson spectral statistics. So they check that uh, there. And some people did uh, other numerics and, and, and blah, blah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, you have these two tools to, to check whether the system is chaotic.
Mm -hmm. And they seem to coincide, so we are okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for, for the lectures. Please. And uh, so the machinery up to there seems fairly general, right? You make no assumptions well, of the, the dynamic. The, Hamil um, the Hamiltonian has to be one body plus yes. two body. Yes, If yes. you have three body, we are, it's out. But yeah, for, for this type of systems, it's fairly general, yeah. Uh -huh. Great, and then like the, the local potential, the is it restricted? Could it be like a disorder potential or something? It can be disorder. No, no problem. And so now, that's, uh, this is something that is very painful, but the thing is, uh, um, in the numerics I show, we put disorder. Uh, we put on-site potentials, which are disorder, but not disorder. We create an ensemble in order to make averages and kill fluctuations. Now, disorder, as, as Anderson disorder, let's say, something that affects the physics because producing localization and all that, we don't have a semi-classical theory of localization. We do, do. Like, wh what, why? <laughs> very, I mean, very simple put is, um, you, have, you have two types of localization, kind of the trivial one and the Anderson one. So the, it should be disorder. That's a disorder potential. And of course, if that's your energy, well, you have a state which is localized there, trivially. There is a has, there is, this is kind of simple uh, mechanism of localization. You just, just put a, a state in a potential well, deep. But actually, Anderson localization happens here. And if I do my semi-classics here, the classical trajectories um, don't, don't, don't feel that much, the, the, the potential. And then since my propagator is based on classical trajectories, uh, you need a different type of, you need a, a semi-classical theory where the main contribution, the main effect, is something that is called diffraction you know, effects, which is indeed formally a subleading uh, thing. So you, you, this, this kind of... Uh, the effect on a plane wave from a potential which is lower doesn't affect the classical trajectory. It affects other things through diffraction. And, uh, well, Martin Sina is really a world-leading expert on, on diffractive uh, effects. And we haven't been able to make it work to produce localization. There is one system. Um, the author of that paper will be here tomorrow, uh, Alex Atlan. They put a bunch of uh, kind of... Um, no, no, wait a second. No, that's Holger. Sorry. I mean, this has been done for graphs. You have in a, in a, in a quantum graph, you have a semi-classical theory for quantum graphs. And then uh, after lots of pain and suffering, you can show uh, signatures of localization in quantum graphs with disorder using semi-classics. But like for a system with orbital degrees of freedom uh, like that, I don't think there is, there is anything. I think Alex has, Alex and Pete Brower, right? They have a bunch of, a, a chain of cavities, yeah. and they use semi-classics, and they kind of claim there is something like localization. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In graphs, in graphs, uh, for sure. Yeah. But let's say this thing I'm, <laughs> I'm doing is too primitive to capture that, for sure. So uh, you can put on site potentials, uh, as you wish, but that's, uh, something in the direction of localization is uh, out of the of question for us, sadly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. This was your question? So this was your question? Okay. Uh, thanks for the lectures. They were really cool. Um, I'm really interested in the creation and annihilation operators of second quantization mm -hmm. because you told that they belong to a larger Fox space. Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is about the quadratures. Like mm -hmm. uh, They also belong to a larger yeah, space. Yeah. They, yeah. There are some, so they must belong. But mm -hmm. is there a way to know um, that they're the correct uh, structure to work with? Because oh, okay. we're mm -hmm. focused in a, in a subspace of, that, of the biggest folk space mm -hmm. that is defined by a constraint. Yes. Uh, yes. But um, how do we know that the correct, that the correct quadrature is that, that one? OK. Um, I, I will give a, usually I don't like practical 
answers based on practical considerations. But in this case, is we needed a continuous basis in focus space to do path integral. And then you have two options. Uh, many of you know this. Uh, you have another option, which is to use the eigenstates of the annihilation operator, which are the bosonic coherent states. They are continuous. The corresponding monster is called the coherent state uh, path integral. But for reasons that I will be super happy to clarify uh, this afternoon, that's very bad for semi-classics. Hmm? And uh, uh, when you have a coherent state, roughly, roughly, okay, a coherent state is something like Q plus IP. And then you have a propagator between coherent states. You have Q initial plus IP initial and Q final plus IP final. What happens there? The problem is overdetermined hmm? because alone the initial conditions fully determine the trajectory. But you want this guy to go there. How do? And then this this uh, this is a mathematical statement. The classical mechanics gets overdetermined in coherent states, and you have to do something very bad. You have to consider that Q and P are complex. It's, it's called you have to complexify the classical dynamics and then go into complex classical dynamics to find complex trajectories doing the job. Terrible. I mean, it's, this is what Steve does, by the way. It's really hard thing to do, and I kind of dislike it. So if you open a book on field theory and look for the bosonic path integral, what you are going to find is the coherent state path integral. Bad for semi-classics. So we, we, we were stuck in there, and then we realized that using quadratures, we can do things without our determination, and we can make things work. So it it's a, was a purely practical uh, consideration. I, if you want to know physics of quadratures, you have to ask for a person doing quantum optics. They, they measure quadratures because they are, they are perfectly valid, observable for photonic systems, but not for cold atom systems. So overdetermination is is bad or it's just bad. in that case because it is com it deals with complex things um, because well, uh, well I, I'm asking you that because I'm working with a model it's mm -hmm. a it's an a dedicated model and there's like a, um, an, a, an integrable limit where mm -hmm. uh, you can you have a, a bigger basis than the, the dimension of the space and mm -hmm. it has been proven to be more efficient to describe this, the system. So when, when, we, when you were talking about the, whole, the complete Fox space, like mm -hmm. the, all, the one that has all the Fox spaces, yes. like that came to my mind because um, yes. that, that basis is also uh, over determining, over, well, it's it's, it has more elements than the necessary to describe the, over the Hilbert complete. space, and it has been proven to be more efficient. So uh, yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that. My motivation was to do semi-classics uh, here. Okay. And then this, this, uh, this, uh, um, there are several super powerful tools that I cannot use because simply I cannot, uh, I cannot use them for the semi-classical program. Grassmann variable for fermions, beautiful, nice. I don't know how to do semi-classics with this. So there are many things that I, I, I didn't do because of that. And uh, I, I will agree that uh, coherent states are super powerful in Bases which are uh, over complete are super powerful, but uh, they I want them to give me a sensible classical limit, a sensible definition of semi classical regime, and a good semi classical propagator. Okay, the, this you. lecture was biased in that direction. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> wow. So you were mentioning that in in the quantum optic case, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, measure like different quadratures than this, but it's not clear to me why that cannot be done here. So I is it not possible to define a continuous basis here for any arbitrary pair of orthogonal uh, quadratures? You you cannot find a continuous basis in that case for this for the semi-classical. I know. I mean, um, one? I can mix Q and P. I can rotate Q and P linearly, a rotation, uh, to any angle. That, 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 that for sure. But uh, the problem is, is, is more fundamental. Uh, the, the Q and P, um, if you express the Q and P eigenstates, the quadrature uh, eigenstates, 
in terms of uh, FOC states. You have FOC states of all possible total number of particles. And then for massive systems, with bosonic systems of massive particles, not photonic, that's the thing. The photon, you can always put a photon, but you cannot always put a, 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 an atom. Mm. And then what you can show is that there is no, um, there is no operator, admissible operator, for which the eigenstates are uh, quadrature for called uh, bosonic atoms. I can go into details. This, this is called, uh, it was a big deal. I mean, whether a quadrature or a coherent state is actually a good re representation of the physical state of a system of massive bosons was a big deal some 20, 30 years ago. And Tony Leggett came and solved it and found out something that is called a super selection principle that tells you only uh, states with the sa same total number of particles can be coherently superimposed. Okay. And if, if you have total different, then this is something you can define it, uh, but this you cannot prepare it. My statement is that quadratures cannot be pre quadratures of cold atom systems cannot be prepared. That's my statement. For photons, you do it all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. Mm. Okay. This is not uh, the best answer, but this is kind of tricky subject, and we can discuss it. I can give you some literature. Mm. Okay, thanks. So thank you again.